We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. I'm everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to go through the website. It's definitely true because that way they don't get lost. I don't miss them. I don't get a missed notification. They don't end up in my Facebook other folder. For those of you who don't know what that is, look into it because you probably got 20 messages there. You didn't know were there. Uh, they weren't muted by Twitter or whatever. Uh, that's the best way to do it. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Now, I am going to say something right now. We could use more questions. We're not at the bottom of the barrel, but we are getting towards the bottom of the pot. So we are looking for your questions. Questions like. All right. This week, we've got a question from S. Darkwell, who writes, A few months ago, I began a bi-weekly-ish gaming night. My friends provide the location, and my girlfriend and I provide the games and teach them to play. I've come to realize that I'm atrocious at describing how to play board games. I'm relatively new to these games myself, but if I were to simply sit down and play, I could do so without issue. The moment it comes time to teach others, however, my mind becomes scattered and I begin forgetting even fundamental rules. I regularly spend hours watching board game review how to play videos, but they don't seem to have improved my teaching skills in any meaningful way. I suspect that the issue is that in any given situation, my focus snaps to the social aspect of the environment when I should be describing the board game. Instead, I'm noticing whenever anyone shifts their weight, glances elsewhere, or moves a component. The irony is that in the past, I've been hired to give informative presentations on stage in front of hundreds of people and never had an issue. Something about the smaller, more personal environment makes teaching a board game a far greater challenge. Firstly, do you have any recommendations on how to teach board games, or how to better teach board games in general? And secondly, do you have any suggestions on how to maintain focus on teaching the game instead of the people in the room? Thank you in advance for the advice and be well. And now I really wish I had a Casey Kasem impression. I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for the detailed question, S. Um, I got to say, I love that style of question. I love the long form questions. I, I, that gives us a lot more to work with, a lot more to dig into. Then please help us teach games or please give me three player <laughs> games that feature dinosaurs and pink pirates. I, I, I dig the long form questions. So thank you for that. Uh, so we did, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago in the lobby, we co we have covered teaching games in the past, uh, specifically two times, way back to episode five, back to school. I gave some general teaching tips on tips on what I do to teach a game or the, the tricks I use when teaching a game. And then we answered a question about the difference between teaching gamers and non-gamers or new gamers versus experienced gamers. And that was in episode 23, second semester. Now, those are both still great places to look for some overall and general game teaching advice, though I have to admit we sound a bit rough in episode five. Now, what neither of those questions directly address is the second part of S's question here. Plus, it's been a while since we've covered teaching in general. Like, episode five was a long time ago at this point, so is uh, episode 23. We're on 72, 71 now, so it's been a while. So I think a quick overview wouldn't hurt, so we're going to go over my general teaching rules, my general teaching tips, but there's gonna be more in depth from the long time ago and the older episodes. Now, the other thing that our previous discussions on teaching really focused on was the players. It was all on what you can do to get through to the players, not a lot on focus on the person teaching. So this is, we're gonna throw that in with this to more directly ad uh, address Esther's question. Absolutely, again, there's, there's a lot of different factors here. Uh, and again, we, we don't necessarily know what their group is made up of, what their, uh, you know, the relationship within the group is. We know it's him and his girlfriend uh, who are, who are, you know, the gamers of the organ of the, of the group teaching to other people, but you know, it could be, you know, close friends, acquaintances, you know, things like that can make a difference too, because the level of comfort you have with people you're teaching can really make a big difference. Yep. And one of, I, I would say S and their girlfriend, cause we don't know for sure. That's true. Um, so one of the things we talked about before is learning how players learn and trying to focus on this. Now, this is something you could either ask people how they learn best or something you learn over time, or just make sure you cover all the bases. So are we going to basically reiterate this? Cause I still think it's worthwhile advice and it's not something everyone thinks about when they're going to teach something. Now this applies to basically teaching anything, not just teaching games. Um, 
And that's the fact that people learn in a variety of different ways and different people are going to focus more or be more adept at learning through different methods. Uh, the main three being reading, listening, and watching. So reading, uh, going back to ask this question specifically here, I personally learn better by reading. Deanna is a perfect example of someone who I'm better off handing a rule book or letting her read the rule book ahead of time than sitting down at the table trying to teach her to play. She absorbs way better by reading than by listening or watching. Now, if you know you're going, you're gonna, you have difficulty teaching and you have players at the table who love reading and learn that way, perhaps you can get them the book ahead of time. So you can pass or pass the book around if it's not too big. If it's only four page rule book, pass it around. While I'm setting up this table, how about you guys read through the rule book quick? Or if you know you're gonna have three players, print off three PDF copies of the game or bring PDFs on mobile devices or ask people to bring them up on their phones. This may save you from having to teach at all. It'll let the players do the work themselves. Absolutely, and this is this can be a huge benefit. Uh, I know recently, perfect uh, instance is Horrified. Um, yeah. I hadn't played it uh, during Extra Life, or as you had, and you were comfortable teaching it, but you guys were upstairs, you know, getting the girls off to school, I think, and I sat down with the, the book, had a quick read through, so that when we sat down, yeah, there was still some teaching, but it was more of a, oh, here's the actual pieces and mm -hmm. things because I'd only read the manual and I hadn't seen the bits. Yep. Um, but, you know, having that little bit of extra familiarity of reading through the manual, even just flipping through the manual can make a huge difference. Yeah. So another tip too is to have uh, player summary sheets, esoteric order of gamers we mentioned many times in the show, summary sheets, rule summaries, player cards, stuff for the readers to look at while you're teaching is another, another just a bonus tip there so that you give them something to read while you're teaching, which again can help S because it's gonna take the player's focus off of you, them, and put it onto something else, which may actually help with that nervousness, which we'll get to more of that later. Yep. Now, as for a second learning technique, next is listening. So now this is probably the most common. Someone wants to sit and listen to you teach. This is the tried and true method they've, we've used to teach our kids for good or bad for many, many, many years. Uh, someone teaches, hopefully by already knowing the rules, uh, possibly by reading the rule book. I personally am a very strong proponent of learn the rules before you teach. Don't sit and read the rule book to the group. Uh, this does sound like how things are going for us. It sounds like S is sitting down to the table with their friends and, and teaching verbally by teaching out the rules. Uh, this is, it's gotta be done in a way, right? Like this is the default method. This is, this is how it's going to happen. The thing is to add the other stuff to it so you're touching multiple bases, especially when we get to the next method of learning. So you don't wanna just, if you can, don't just sit and narrate, try to make it interesting. All of the the, the social speaking things, right? Um, gauge player interest, all, all the stuff you would have in a normal public speaking. Now this is one I, I more recommend Listen to our previous episodes. We go into more detail on how to make sure people are listening. Yeah. But in this case, this is probably the main way you're going to be teaching. And it's more use the other tricks with this. Now, one thing that he mentioned, they mentioned, sorry, I still don't want to assume. One thing they mentioned is that they get distracted when they're teaching by the things the other people are doing. Now, little trick, especially since they do mention that they have done public speaking events, is get a bright light in your eyes. If you've got a light behind someone that's distracting you and, you know, keeping you focused the way you would if you're on stage, you know, having that bright light in your eyes helps you focus on what you're talking about. Now, this has got, this has got some problems in other aspects of, of how we, we, we think you should teach. But if you are finding yourself being distracted by little things like that, sometimes finding something else to focus on as mm -hmm. a distraction can really help you step back away from focusing on little details that, have no, uh, you know, have no benefit. Yep. All right, uh, the third method of learning is watching. Uh, one of the things is it's important not just to talk when teaching. So this is basically what I was alluding to a few seconds ago. You also want to do things. Go through the motions, move pieces, flip cards, point to things, touch things, um, focus on the, on the game. Now, going back to S's problem, perhaps another alternative to S teaching is to use all those videos they mentioned. Uh, they watch tons of videos, they know where to find the videos, bring a tablet to game night or stop off in front of a PC or a smart TV and bring up a watch it play video. We have done this. I've only done it once at my house, but there was a game I wanted to learn. The instruction book was a little too thick and we wanted to get it to the table that night. 
And I'm like, look, I don't want to read from the rule book to you guys. Let's all move over to the TV. Let's boot up um, YouTube. I found a watch it play video. We sat down and watched the watch it play video. And then we went and played brass is what that game particular was. And I'm like, that's a bigger, heavier game. That wasn't something I was going to teach from the rule book. Um, or bring have everyone bring it up on their phones. Possibly not the best way to do it because everyone's going to, well, at least if you're all sitting around the TV, you're being somewhat social. Uh, we have actually done that for also an FAQ where we brought it up and literally just stood a tablet up on the side and everyone kind of watched it and went, oh, okay, that's how you do it. And another example is many games now have QR codes that you can scan to watch them. So it's another thing you do right then is, hey, all right, I've kind of explained what's going on. Let's bring up the QR code and let's put this tablet on and let's all sit and watch a watch a play video or something like that. Yep. Now, I, there's a bunch of things going on here. Part of it is you don't want to be a perfectionist. You're going to make mistakes in your first play. We talk over and over again about, you know, playing the extreme rules, right? Yep. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, now, again, there could be players in the group that are hardcore gamers and have issues with that, but that's a different, that's a different issue. Realistically, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes on your first time through. It's yeah. probably going to happen no matter how good a teacher you are. Um, I, when it comes to the watching issue, uh, I find realistically the best way to play is watching you all play. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can actually start a game and say, look, we're going to play uh, you know, a 20 minute intro to this game and learn as we play. And then we're going to throw it all out and start over again. This can be a huge benefit to some people who just need to see how things actually interact yeah. and how pieces move and how scoring happens. And again, depending on the game with, you know, something like uh, DC deck builder, not as beneficial because mostly you're just moving cards around and reading whatever it says on the card. But if you're playing something intricate like uh, Dead Men's Cabal or, you know, Imhotep, where how things move makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take 20 minutes and rather than reading the rule book, play around and, and struggle a little bit and help everyone understand that movement and that interaction, mm -hmm. you're watching yourself play and, 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 and learning as a group. And you don't have to be that teacher that's standing up in front of the class. Yeah, Sean basically stole what I was going to say next. So <laughs> like I say, basically, the, there's the three ways to learn, but there is one more, the, the fourth, which is doing, actually physically doing. And I set that one aside because that is the most effective. The best way to learn a new skill, to learn something new, is to actually do it. Physically do the thing. Go through the process. Uh, before you get to actually jumping into the game, which is one of my big suggestions, is if you don't, if it's a game you do need some front loading, you do have to teach stuff, have people get involved. Don't do it all yourself. Have the other players help you set up. Have them move the pieces. Have them start out hand, with starting hands. If you want to show an example of a Catan, how to build a house, give them the hand of cards with the hand with, with the, the resources to build a house and have them put the meeple on the board and have them physically do it. Um, and then, as Sean said, if you can get to the game as soon as possible, get playing. A lot of games. A perfect example of this is I was teaching Dead Man's Cabal Extra Life not Dead Man's Cabal, Dead Man's Draw, Dead Man's Draw, sorry. Dead Man's Draw card game, a push your luck card game. And I had been a long time since I played it and I could have read through the rules. And I'm like, no, let's just flip up a card. It's a hook. What's that do? Grab the rule book. Look up what a hook does. All right, draw the next card. It's a sword. What's that do? Oh, it's another hook. We know what that one does, right? By the time we played through one full round, we'd gone through all the different 10 card types. We then went, all right, everyone knows all the cards. We're going to throw this game out. We're going to start over. We're going to play. That's the whole lost time fallacy. We brought it up on the show before. Because you have started a game, you don't have to finish, especially a teaching game. And that, that's our pro tip, right? Go play until everyone understands the game, then start over and play for real. That first game should always be considered a teaching game for everyone involved. You're probably going to make mistakes. Don't worry about who's winning. Don't worry about if someone messes up something or forgot something two turns ago. This is when it's perfectly fine. For Sean to go, oh, you know what? Two turns ago, I should have taken two points because I did this. Let Sean do it. This is where you're all just trying to learn the game. It's also a chance for experienced players. Here's where you play silly. You play stupid. You use you, you use um strategies you never would normally do in a normal game. This is where you can kind of mess with the other players because this game doesn't matter. This is your teaching game. Then once you're done the teaching game, you play again and play for real. Although... Don't mess with people too much because you still want them to learn the game yeah, well, and also yes, like yes. the game. You don't want to, you know, 
if you if in your teaching game, even though scoring doesn't matter, you trump them five hundred to three, the you know the. <laughs> Yeah, might I might mean, not it's, want it's to play the game where you're playing game. Zaya and you tried to jump into the sun is more yeah. what I was trying to suggest. Yes, yeah, yeah. not not the let's keep poking the bear <laughs> method of uh, goofing around with the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, you know, this goes into something again that we've said so many times since we picked it up at Breakout, which is fail faster. And that goes with playing the game too. Get in there, play the game, fail, play extreme, and learn from those failures because a lot of times people aren't going to realize those mistakes until they've actually made them themselves. Yeah. Uh, another thing too is once you've done your teach, right? Once you played once, reread the rule book. This is something every game teacher should do. So you figure out what you did to extreme. Yeah. Uh, uh, one that I've seen people do at cons that I think this is actually a brilliant thing is you do the teach, right? You do the thing and then you're going to do your restart. It's time to play the real game now. Take a washroom break, bring the rule book with you, do a quick review while you're getting that little break, while the game's getting reset up. And then when you come back, that way you don't look like you had to check the rules, right? <laughs> Yeah. No, All right. Get into. The, yep. Go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. All right. Get into the second part of S's question. We already we already covered some ways they can they can do some things to try to to help with their focus, right? So S's problem here is that they basically get nervous and anxious when going to teach a game and forget the game rules. So here are a few suggestions we've come up with, or I've come up with. I'm sure Sean's got some of his own. Uh, one of the main ones to me, and I do this myself because I'll have the same problem if I'm spending too much time looking at the players. I'm going to get frustrated by the player who's on their phone. I'm going to get annoyed at someone who's obviously not going to be paying attention. And I'm going to be nudging Deanna to wake her up because she's falling asleep because she'd be better off reading the rule book. One of the things I do to stop that, because I realize people do learn different ways. Meanwhile, the player who's on their phone is on their phone because they played the game before and they don't care. The player who's falling asleep has already read the rule book, right? That might be the case. Um, what I try to do is focus on the game components, the game, the table, the, the state of the table. I don't look at the players, I focus on the game. This isn't public speaking. You're not trying to orate and project and connect with the audience, you're trying to teach a game. Eyes on the cards, the boards, the components. And as I said before, make sure you do, make sure you're moving things around, make sure you're flipping cards. When you say you draw seven cards, draw seven cards. When you say you move your guy from here to here on the board, move a guy from here to here on the board. When it says collect resources, grab the resources and hand them to that player who's on their phone to bring them back to the table. Um, Make it very obvious where your focus is. So while you're talking about a section of the board, like use your hands to kind of guide people or lean over the board that way. And not only will your focus be there, other people's focus will follow. They'll be like, oh, what are you looking at, right? They're going to lean into. Yeah, no, it's it's a big thing. And again, this this goes to what I was saying earlier, but, you know, find something to distract yourself with, whether you're staring into a light or whatever. If you're staring at the board, you're not worrying about the other things. And part of what you are getting into is you might be worrying about the other people and whether or not they're learning. Well, guess what? Doesn't matter. You're yeah. there to teach. They're there to learn. If they don't want to learn, you aren't going to make them learn. So you need to teach the game and let them worry about learning. And if they have questions, they need to re be responsible enough to ask those questions or, hey, can you slow, slow down a little bit? Or, hey, could you go over that thing you just did again? That's mm -hmm. on them. You need to just teach as you know. And it sounds like you know the rules. I mean, it sounds like mm -hmm. this person has, has, has put in the time, put in the effort, and knows this game. And that's great. That's the very first step. But once you do that, teaching it is a matter of passing it on, but you can't be responsible for someone else taking it in. That's mm -hmm. on them. And it sounds like there's a little bit of that worrying about the other players too much, which is natural, but it's something you need to get over. Uh, and let them learn if they want to learn. And if not, well, they're going to be the one who's not enjoying the game as much, unfortunately. Yeah, or unfortunately, you may have the player where they're going to ask you things you've explained 20 times already, multiple times while you play, and it happens. Yep. Some people are like that. Yep. Uh, it, they're they're going to have missed things, and that's just something you're going to have to deal with. And I wonder if once they're playing, if S doesn't have that problem, now that they're in the game state, if someone's like, oh, I can't remember, is it 20 or 30 points when I do this? If they're perfectly fine, then it's just the anxiety of standing in front of the small group and everyone's attention's focused on them. Yeah. Which is another thing I want to address is perhaps the problem is that it's the fact that you have a table of four people looking expectantly at you, not a room full of people. A room full of people is something abstract. Three people right in your face looking at you is very different socially and anxiety wise. So one of the things to do is get it so that the players aren't looking at you. So as Sean said, you can be distracted. Maybe a, a, a different way to look at it is to distract the players. 
Now, again, this, to me, goes back to getting them to do something, getting them to look at the boards, getting them to shuffle. If it's not, if it isn't a game where you can have them do that, find something to distract the players. So, hey, can you shuffle this deck? Hey, can you grab these dice? Hey, can you put the baggies back into the box? Just something to kind of keep them busy so they're not looking at you while you teach. Now, you don't want to distract them too much. So I would try to keep it game focused. So if possible, it can be, how about you all draw your starting hands? How about you count the number of cards you've got in your deck, stuff like that, so they're still focused on the game? Like, I wouldn't send anyone away from the table, obviously, but even give them something to do so they're not staring in your face. That may help. Yep. Uh, and again, it's one of those things where maybe you need to start teaching earlier. So if you're going to someone's house and setting up the game and then sitting down and teaching, maybe that teaching should start as soon as you put that board down on the table yep. and getting them to help spread out that game, put out the game, because as you're teaching that, um, as, you're, as you're putting those pieces out and getting your hands on it, mm -hmm. uh, you're learning, right? Every time you're touching the game and touching the pieces, you are learning. Uh, and so that's a teaching experience right yep. from the time the box lid comes off. And like I said, use a mix, right? You touch them and have them touch them too. Try to get both. Yep. Uh, then next, I want to recommend that you practice, right? Uh, as we said before, teaching is a skill. I don't know if we said it today, but at least in our previous episodes, and every skill gets better by doing it. And you can practice. Now, I don't know about teaching in front of a mirror, but play the game solo. Touch the component solo. Play it by yourself. While you're playing by yourself, talk out loud. Talk as if you were teaching. Talk about the movements you're doing. Okay, and now I'm going to play five cards. And by playing five cards, that means I get to take this resource. And that resource I'm taking so that I can do this. And say that as you're playing solo with yourself. So you get familiar with talking about the rules, the uh, technology of the game is the wrong word, the mechanics, the the nomenclature, the the vocabulary of the game you want to get used to. That's one I'm terrible at. I am like, besides the fact I'm always going to talk, tell cranking, tapping, twisting is always going to be tapping. But like some games call collecting resources one thing, and another game will call it something else. Or our terminology sometimes gets gets mixed up, and I tend to use generic ones, but I try to stick to the ones used in those games. Um, or or what? When we were playing Pulsar 2849, I kept calling it, they were arrays, they were communicators, they were tel telescope. I don't know. We kept coming up with different names for the things. You can learn them. Uh, another thing, too, is practice, right? Um, I don't know, like, S is obviously playing with their girlfriend, but are they playing in public? Are they playing with friends? Are they playing with family? May all matter. If you were going to be teaching to strangers, perhaps a good suggestion would be play it not with strangers first, play at home. So this is something Deanna and I tried to do is I will try to play a two-player version at home way before I bring a game out to public play events. And Deanna's more going to be more forgiving than someone at a game night who's especially at a game store where I'm trying to promote a game, right? I'm doing a demo of a game I, I where I'm potentially selling a copy of the game. I don't want that to be my first teaching experience for the game. If I teach it to Deanna first, we can, first of all, we can play through it. I can learn the game better. I can learn my teaching skills better, how to better explain the game. And I can learn... Uh, and to me, you have to play a game once to be able to teach it well, because as we're going to see in the review section, sometimes you don't realize the importance of certain things until you played the game once. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and and Dee's mentioning, you know, teach it with your girlfriend. So yeah. you know, if you know, do that. If you know, if if you if you are with uh, your girlfriend, if you live if you live with them, they're a trapped uh, <laughs> a trapped audience. Uh, so it does sound like the girlfriend in this case is a gamer. So you got yeah. that bonus. So, so, you know, use the time to teach them uh, the game and maybe they can help you focus or, you know, give feedback as to the teaching rather than the game. You know, if they're, they'll learn, they can learn the game or not learn the game, mm -hmm. but they can focus on seeing what may or may not be working with your teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, if you've got someone you trust that closely to, you can get critiqued better that way. Yeah. Um, as for public playing, asking people, how'd my teach go? That's up to you. Uh, you may or may not be able to handle that feedback, but it's worth asking if you think you can ask people, like if, if you had a hard time, I think in most cases, players are going to be very, very forgiving. This goes back to our episode on how to be a better GM. You are there teaching the game to a bunch of people who are there to enjoy the game. They are going to be thankful someone is teaching them and they're going to overlook a lot of little things because you are doing them a favor. You are doing them a service. You are doing something for them. You are giving them the gift of teaching them this game. People are going to be grateful for that. I don't know anyone who's going to tear up your teaching while you're teaching. Yep. Uh, 
And Dee is mentioning that, you know, if you have already taught your girlfriend, then they're able to help you teach, right? They're able to say, oh, what about that uh, that yeah. section over here that you just completely accidentally skipped over? <clears throat> yeah, very true. So that, that was going to be my final suggestion that I can think of, unless I come up with something before the end of the show, uh, which is to look for someone else to teach. Uh, like, maybe you're the person, you're the game teacher, right? You're the, the especially in role-playing groups, you're, you've always been the DM, so you're the DM, and you're stuck being the DM. But usually there's other people in the area to each. If you are that uncomfortable with teaching, have someone else teach or have someone else help you teach or have someone be backup. Like Deanna just mentioned, that'd be perfect, right? Like here, I'm going to teach this game, but can you be here just in case I miss anything? So you get that backup. You get the confidence of having someone who knows the game. Like Danielle mentioned in the chat room earlier, the biggest thing she's worried about is missing something important. Having someone with the background there. Uh, when you show up to a table, you go to teach a game, ask if anyone else is there is familiar with the game and if they're comfortable teaching if you're not. I end up having to do this a lot at the board game blitz where there's four different tables going. So I get to play the game as, does anyone at this table know how to teach this? Okay, everyone knows. Okay, you're good. And then I go to the next table. Is everyone, is someone at this table know how to teach this one? Okay, you're not too comfortable. Okay, I may be back, you know, and I kind of go around and, and, and spend my time. Um, plus there's the alternatives we mentioned earlier. Perhaps you can hand out copies of the rule book. You can hand out PDFs. You can hand out summary sheets. You, um, which brings me to another one. Uh, you can do watch it play videos. The other thing is you can, heavy cardboard is good for this. And I don't know if anyone else is doing this. Now, heavy cardboard run by Edward does teach teaching videos, but they do heavy games and heavy games are notoriously hard to teach. Well, what he puts available for everyone is their script. So this is something else you can consider. It's not something I've ever done is you could script your teach ahead of time, or you can find someone else's script. So a part of your problem with public speaking or your problem with with learning or teaching the game is that you're worried you might forget something. Having a script could fix that, where you literally have something in front of you that you can read out loud. Now, this does bring up the problem that you're reading out loud to people, which I find tends to put people to sleep and they don't absorb it well. Like, I, I think you're better knowing it, but by having the script there, you can at least go through it to see if there's anything you miss. Yeah, absolutely. Now, again, Edward, Heavy Cardboard, we'll put a link in the show notes. I don't know how many he has out there, and I haven't seen anyone else doing it. Maybe this is a niche. Maybe we, we could start doing Tabletop Bellhop Teach Scripts. That, that could be our, our new niche, because I don't know if it's one that's been through there. But that might help with the anxiety. Even just, like for public speaking, right? I, I've done public speaking myself. I always prefer to go up with the script, but I never follow it. But the script's there, right? It's it's almost the, the Linus's blanket. It's the fact that I've got everything. And as I'm teaching, I can flip through it to make sure I didn't miss anything. And just knowing that I have that there will help. Oh, absolutely. All right. Do we have any other suggestions from the chat room? Uh, no, we've got some uh, other than Zanister making, uh, you know, pointing out that uh, after the teach, then you go in and crush their dreams of ever winning the game again by beating them yes. horribly. Well, an important part of your teach should always be we are playing this for fun. Yep. It's 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 almost the uh, it is the I'm trying to forget how it starts the the improv show uh, where the the rules are made up and the points don't matter. Well, here the yep. rules aren't made up. The rules matter, but the points don't matter. I, yep. I play to win, but I don't care if I win or lose. And I think everyone should play by that philosophy. Always try your best to win the game, but you know what? It's all about having fun and playing games with other people at the table and having a good time. And if someone crushes everyone else, good on them. Yep. I never played to crush anyone, especially in a teaching game, but I don't go light on anyone either. Same way I do it when I'm playing with my kids. Yep. All right. If you've got a question for us, like our one today from S, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. <laughs> 